many times have you thought about what it feels like to be you? And what does being me or being you really mean? We'd like you to imagine sometime in the future you're sitting in a comfortable chair. You're online and connected to some amazing immersive technology, which you've come to rely on to monitor your home, your health, to do your shopping, to enable you to be educated and to work, and to provide you with whatever information, news and entertainment you may want, and where the technology can even monitor your thoughts. Imagine also that everything you've ever done and everywhere you've ever been since the day you were born has been recorded and processed as memories. Your artificial intelligence assistants know so much about you that they can be you or a better version of you online. And they can do this forever. As we're imagining this future, I'm wondering if, like me, you're getting a sense of unease, that for all the advantages technology brings, are we losing our human identity to technology? It may all sound like science fiction and too far out into the future to worry about just now, but Colin and I want to share with you today why we believe we may already be sleepwalking to that future scenario and why these challenges the very idea of our own personal human identity. Who is this with us on stage? This is Maria. She's a 24-year-old. She's a manager who works remotely and has a team of three. She has Insta, TikTok, Twitter, Snapchat, LinkedIn, and she's a gamer too. She has over 2,000 followers and 750 online friends. Maria, just like many of us, is concerned about her identity online and curates how she appears in her professional, in her social, and in her gaming networks. I wonder, Colin, how much time does Maria spend online? A 2022 UK study reported that 18 to 24 year olds spend on average up to five hours online a day. And for gamers, it's up to seven and a half hours, and it's increasing every year. So it's no surprise that Maria is spending more and more time online and generating enormous amounts of personal data. It's interesting that the environments in which we find ourselves can have a profound effect on our behaviour and we won't necessarily realise it's happening. The human brain has evolved with the ability to continually rewire itself. We can learn new skills, form new habits, and even recalibrate our internal reality based on our experiences and memories. This is called neuroplasticity, and the brain can do this throughout our lives. According to Niriel's hook model, in order to create a habit-building loop and manufacture desire, our interaction starts with an external or an internal trigger followed by an action, then a variable reward, and think of the feeling that you get when you're playing in a slot machine. And lastly, an investment, which typically comes in the form of the final user giving something like time, data, social capital, or money. This makes the experience or the product much more valuable in keeping us engaged. Think of this example. We pick or our smartphones, to check the weather, and before we know it, we're already scrolling in email, news, and social media. We outsource knowledge and skills to our technology because it's the easiest option. Instead of having to remember facts and how to do things, we Google them and watch YouTube videos. If we want to go somewhere new, we use GPS. And if we want to write an article or post, then why not you let ChatGPT, Bard, or Copilot do it for us? But there is a cost to this convenience. Studies have shown that people who look up information on Google tend not to remember it. 
and people using GPS are less likely to remember how they got there. Over time, technologies can and will shape and refine our online behavior through unconscious habits. In a sense, the brain has outsourced control of what we do and when to online technology triggers. Is it even possible for Maria to control who she really is when she's online? All the time that Maria is online, the technology can and will notch her thoughts, her feelings, and her behavior. On the one hand, technology allows us to connect in ways that were previously simply unimaginable. We can connect with people around the world, we can share our thoughts, our feelings, our experiences, and build relationships which transcend borders. Yet, on the other hand, it exposes us to a constant stream of information and opinions which can and will shape our beliefs our attitudes in ways that we may not even be aware of. Just like with Maria, our online presence will definitely and is definitely shaped into our identity and also is an integral part of how others perceive us. According to Gallup, we spend over 80,000 hours of our lives at work and for some people, their occupation is an important part of their identity. But with the digital transformation of businesses, once specialist knowledge and skills are now being outsourced to technology, weakening the link between our job and our identity. Throughout history, we've always created tools to help us with our work. Today's technology not only helps us with our thinking work, but is now able to do some of that thinking for us. Essential to our identity is the concept of self-awareness. The self is a social construct shaped by cultural and societal norms, by values, and by beliefs. But in order to experience self is to experience internally our own individuality. Now that AI has become an integral part of our lives, what will happen to our identity when the technology that we use becomes so smart that we are not aware to distinguish between it and us? A 2006 study found that when people were given false information about themselves, which they believed to be true, they incorporated it into their understanding of who they were, suggesting that seeding our memories with a false sense of self-identity may even begin to change the way we understand ourselves. On the online world, the technology that controls the flow of information that shapes our experiences is also changing our understanding and construction of the self. Researchers who analyzed <clears throat> over one million Twitter profiles found that people with less followers were perceived as less influential. Yet, there is no direct relation between influence and followership. Our unconscious mind is responsible for a massive amount of decision-making. In fact, Nobel Prize winner Daniel Kahneman has found that very often, we are not aware of why we do what we do. Our brain is a complex mix of conscious and unconscious processes, and therefore our identities are much more complex than we think. If we continue to seed who we are to how machines and others perceive us, how will that change what it feels like to be us? Perception is reality. But in the digital world, if you're not online, do you really exist? And if an event is not recorded, did it ever happen? Being judged by your peers is part of being human. But when the judgment comes from machines that process you as a set of data points, then to be perceived by the machine 
is a very dehumanizing proposition indeed. <laughs> to all external appearances, Maria is her online identity. The technology that inhabits the online world work on this principle, and we do too. How many people here believe that their online identity is who they really are? Let us go back to our original questions. How many times have you thought about what it feels like to be you? And what does being you or being me really mean? For us, we are very inspired by the work of Anil Seth, a leading researcher in the space of biological basis of conscious experience. We think of our own personal experience of being alive, being biological selves, and being uniquely us. Living and breathing in this precise moment, we feel control and autonomy over our thoughts and our actions, and that we're able to make free choices. Our past not only informs the present, it also informs our expectations of the future. So our personal identities and who we think we are is continually being shaped. By the time we spend online and the choices that technology makes. Through outsourcing our knowledge and skills, our memories and even our thinking too. By how machines and others perceive us and the blurring of boundaries between it and us. The important question is, what are we consciously willing to allow to shape our identities? And what can institutions do? Wouldn't it be great if technology were not only environmentally sustainable for the planet, but also ethically sustainable for humans? that it is responsible for the power it has over all of the things that we feel, think, and how we behave. That instead of being designed for purely business objectives, it is created to protect our collective and our individual identities and our human, as being humans. So we challenge governments, corporations, um, businesses and investors to do two, to two simple steps going forward. To take action and report on their use of ethically, uh, to take action and report on their use of business ethically. Sustainable technologies. Thank you very much. And to be held responsible to this commitment. But as individuals, we're not powerless. So what is it that we can do? Now, it may not be possible to maintain an ethic, uh, authentic sense of self while we're online when the rules of the game are controlled by technology. But we can regularly disconnect and limit the blurring of boundaries between it and us. Maria has created an offline sanctuary, a place to be human, disconnected from technology, where she can be her authentic self and think about who she really wants to be. So our challenge to everybody here today is to, is to do just one thing for your human future. Take back control of your identity and create your own offline sanctuaries. I'm Anna Smith, working progress, mother, wife, sister, friend. And I'm Colin Corby. And just like Maria, we're so much more than our online identities. Thank you. Thank you.